Welcome to the Library of Congress's Cine Latina interview series. This series is dedicated to sharing and documenting the work of emerging and established Latina filmmakers. My name is Mateo Arango, pronouns he, him. I am a junior fellow here at the Library of Congress working on the Cine Latina project. I'm a PhD student in American Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. My research looks at material culture and cultural production as a form of documenting marginalized histories in Latin America. I am honored to be working on this important project this summer alongside junior fellows Carla Camacho and Madeline Griffin, and our project mentor, Danny Thurber. We are working together on this project to create what will be the first resource dedicated to Latinx film in the library's history. They are off camera at the moment, but Carla and Madeline will come in later to introduce themselves and ask a few questions. Today, we're here with the amazing Patricia Cardoso. Patricia became the first Latina film director to be included in the Library of Congress's National Film Registry with her 2002 film, Real Women Have Curves. She is an award-winning director, writer, producer. Her directorial work includes the Sundance Audience Award for Real Women Have Curves, the Student Academy Award winning The Water Carrier, uh, the NAACP nominated television movie, Lies in Plain Sight, the web series, Row, the feature, El Paseo de Teresa, and an episode of Queen Sugar. Patricia is also a professor of theater, film, and digital production at the University of California, Riverside. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We have many questions to get into, so let's get started. Uh, for the first question, uh, I wanted to know, when did you know that you wanted to pursue filmmaking as a career? Oh, uh, that's a good question. But, uh, I think when I was in grad school, you know, I knew that I wanted to be a storyteller since I was a child, since before I learned how to read and write. And I always thought I would be a writer, but uh, I grew up in Colombia and I, there were no, when I graduated from high school, there were no creative writing programs. So I studied anthropology and archaeology, which I loved. And only when I went to grad school to UCLA for filmmaking and on my second year of grad school, I made a short film called The Air Gloves. And I realized with that film that I really had talent, that I had a voice that was very different and that I loved the, the process of making films. So it was um, in grad school. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I, that's really interesting. I, I was actually born in Colombia as well and uh, raised here in the States though. Um, are there any filmmakers that have influenced your work when you were growing up or yeah. when you were in film school? Well, uh, many different filmmakers, you know, uh, I love Pedro Almodovar movies. He's just like, a, you know, such a sort of inspiration, you know, for he's like so creative and I love the tone of his movies. You know, they're all very real, but they they have like a magical, like you have humor, but it still has drama. Uh, I love his work. You know, growing up in Colombia, there was a, a Colombian filmmaker, her name is um, Camila Lobo Guerrero, and she directed, uh, she was the first female director in Colombia, and uh, she made a movie called Con su Musica Otra Parte, and it was the first Colombian movie I ever saw, and I was already in college, I was 20 years, 21 years old, and it was, it made such a big impact on me to see people like me on the screen, you know, talking about representation, I have never seen a movie that had Colombian people on screen. And, uh, and she like caused this, this big impact in my life. And then like Luis Valdez, when I moved to the US to, to uh, go to grad school to UCLA, I just happened to go to see La Bamba, you know, and I was not aware that, that there was no representation of Latine people in, on a screen. And I love that movie. So, and you know, like Luz Valdez is such an inspiration. There is um, the filmmaker Jane Campion that I also loved her, her work and especially her movie, The Piano. And I love uh, Hitchcock. It's just like one of my favorite filmmakers because he is such a visual storyteller. So those are just some of them, you know, it, it varies. I go through different, different phases. Really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, for my last question, in addition to filmmaking, I was wondering how does your career as a film professor and also previously as an anthropologist inform your filmmaking process when writing and directing a film? Well, it it uh, you know it's it's a huge uh, it, it has a big impact. You know, I always think that I am like a cinematic anthropologist 
because I uh, every movie that I direct, every episode of television that I direct, uh, I am always approaching it from an anthropological perspective, you know, from like a deep respect toward the, the characters, towards the story. I do a lot of research to make the stories very real, the places very real, and also the characters to make them uh, to make them be real, like the movie you mentioned that was nominated for an NAACP award, Elias in Plain Sight, it deals with incest. And at the time, you know, I just I read all the books about incest and I talked with the experts in the US about incest. So I am a little obsessive about research, but I think it really pays off. And, um, and you know, it comes from that background as an anthropologist. And, and my background as a professor, I just, um, you know, I'm, I'm a very collaborative, you know, I, I every single student I've had, and I've had hundreds of students over the years because I've taught at the UC Riverside for five years before I taught at USC for seven years, at UCLA for two years, UCLA Extension for 10 years. So I had lots of students and every single student I've had, they have the potential to tell these amazing stories. And, uh, and you know, so I think I never think that I have to tell them what to do, but help them find their voices, help them find their stories. And, 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 uh, and that also applies to the way that I approach directing. I'm a very collaborative director. I, you know, like I, with the actors, you know, with the cinematographer, with the production designer, with the editor, I, uh, I thrive in collaboration. And you know, filmmaking is such a collaborative art that uh, I, I just, uh, that's really important to me. And it comes also every single relationship I have, you know, it has that respect where like, I like to give uh, each artist, each filmmaker, each um, uh, actor like, the space so that they can uh, they can bloom. And the, so I, tr uh, it's a lot of trust between us. They trust me, I trust them and a lot of creativity. And you know, ultimately, yes, I have to, sometimes I have to like make decisions that they don't like, but in a collaborative way, like we, uh, we always create something that I think is really powerful. Thank you so much. Um, I will now be passing it over to Carla to ask a few more questions about your filmmaking process. Well, like Mateo said, my name is Carla. Um, I'm a junior fellow also here at the Library of Congress, also working on the Cine Latina project. And I want to thank you so much for being here with us. It's been really exciting to hear about your responses or Mateo's questions already. Um, a little bit about me. I'm from Brownsville, Texas. I'm a recent graduate from Yale University, where I studied ethnic studies and education studies, with a focus on the history of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands and the history of education. And like Mateo kind of already alluded to, I'd like to talk a little bit about your filmmaking process and your experience as a Latina film director. So about your, fil your film, Real Women Have Curves, could you tell us a little bit more about how your lived experiences have informed or inspired your storytelling in this film? Yeah, well, it, uh, my life experiences completely impact the way I directed the movie. When I first read the script, the, the story is that relationship between a mother and a daughter. And it was very similar relationship to my own experience with my mother and my relationship. So that completely was like the, the creative engine, the engine, the connection that I had with the story that gave me the the you know the clarity of how to make authentic emotional scenes and uh, resonate with you know with a very universal story and and also you know my live experience that you know I love uh, like the Latin Latine and the Latin American popular culture like I love like our murals I love the way we dressed and the popular culture is just I'm always since I was a child I was very attracted to it. So uh, the, this movie is set in East LA, and I had always loved those streets. I have taken pictures there, so it gave me the opportunity to 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 recreate that world, that setting that I love so much, on the screen. So um, so that lived in experience impact that, and and the same with the you know the the other characters, you know, like when we. You know, there are so few movies made about us and by us, about the Latin community. That is a huge responsibility to make these movies. 
And um, when I got the job, this was a movie that HBO was hiring a director for. I realized, you know, that, that you know it was going to have a big impact, and everyone that sees it because there are so few movies about the Latina community are going to think that oh, this is how all the Latin people are. So I had a, a big challenge with the fact that it's a mother that doesn't want her daughter to go to college because first, it's not true that in our culture, we would, you know, just the opposite in, our, in, in the Latin culture. From my experience, education is such a high value. And, um, and that, you know, I had to come to terms that it was just this character. It was this mother that didn't want to. But then I was able to change things in the script because in the original you know, script, the father didn't want her to go to college and was also like more what we usually have the stereotype of the Latino man who could be violent. And I changed that character to make it support her daughter going to college. And I modeled it after my father and after my husband, which are like Latino men who are very kind and supportive. So, um, so again, that you know, again, that's my experience that I was able to to use to direct a movie. Thank you for sharing that, and thank you for making this really important film. You know, with different, like you said, representations that are don't often get seen in in the movies, right? Uh, my second question is kind of related to the theme of representation. How is representation important when it comes to casting for a film or deciding who's in the writing room, for example? And no, how does it influence the filmmaking process? Oh, it is essential. It is so important. I, th I, I think that what is very important is for every filmmaker, you know, and filmmakers were, you know, the writers, the directors, the producers, the, the actors, you know, like to have an awareness of that representation. And, you know, in the casting, of course, it's people that are going to be in front of the screen. And, you know, and, you know for us, the Latinx community, we're so uh, underrepresented in front of the screen and behind the screen that it's just appalling to see, you know, where 20% of the U.S. population, 50% of the Los Angeles population. And historically, when we see movies uh, set in Los Angeles, you know, we're invisible or we're relegated to, to, to be housekeepers or you know, or gardeners or to be gang, gang members. So uh, it is very important to, to be aware of, uh, of whom we're casting and, uh, and trying to get as much representation that is diverse because there are gang members that are Latine and it is, it is completely important also to have that representation, but it's important to open up the representation that it shows all our complexity and our diversity because we're very, diverse and you know, in terms of the writing room too is like we uh, most of us write and direct from our lived experience so if we have had the experience of being a member of the latina community we're all gonna able to contribute a lot to the uh, how is that representation made you know when i'm casting uh, you know when i'm casting um, a movie or a pilot, I have all the power to like really be in front of the casting process and decide who makes who gets cast. It's always a, a collaborative process with the producers and the studio, but I have a big voice. Or when I'm making a pilot, when I'm doing an episode, uh, the main uh, characters are already cast, but I get to cast the smaller roles, maybe like the one time, one time. Um, a character that is only in one episode or that is beginning an arc or a smaller, and I even get to cast the background. <laughs> and even the background is important because I, you know, like, and so I think every time I cast an actor that is Latine or that is, you know, I, I'm always looking to have a balance, you know, and I always like to see a, a, a percentage, you know, I'm always, well, if I'm, I'm directing a, a project in New Jersey or in Atlanta, it's like I look at, you know, what is the percentage of the population here? And I like to, to represent it, you know, 50% women, 50% uh, Latina in the case of Los Angeles, or and in in uh, the a lot of African Americans in in uh, Atlanta, and to represent how that reality is, because I think that that is very easy to to you know as audience members we just uh, you know we just consume and consume and consume, and those little things uh, have a big impact, you know in in, um, I directed a pilot for an Amazon series that is coming up next month in August. It's called Harlan Covers, Harlan Cohen's Shelter. And I was able to cast in the lead. And 
an African Latin actor, young actor, teenager, and that my uh, Jaden Michael, who's incredibly talented, and that was huge. You know, I think that you know it's like I think it's the first time that a, a major series in the U.S. has a lead that is African Latin, um, and and um, and that impacts the rest of it. And I'm also, you know, I'm not only thinking about the Latin. Uh, representation. I'm always thinking about the people with disabilities, the LGBT community, the people of color, women, people of different ages. I have a lot of awareness towards that. And in shelter, again, I was able to cast their two roles that were uh, uh, that I was able to cast uh, uh, members of the LGBTQ community. And it was amazing to have, like, in the lead roles to queer, amazing actors. And you know, out of the five recurrent roles, four are uh, people from underrepresented backgrounds, and that is incredibly powerful. Thank you for sharing about your process, and thank you so much about how much intention you put into everything you do as a director. Um, my last question is: Looking at your career, uh, we saw, of course, that you've worked in both film and television. What are some of the differences between the two? And do you prefer one over the other? You know, I love both. You know, I just love filmmaking. You know, and I'm, you know, like, and, you know, television making is the same process. You know, we're working with actors. We're working with cinematography. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I, I would love to keep doing both of them. And they have uh, something really powerful about the, the um, television is the audience that it has it every you know it's millions and millions and millions of populace of people and it has a, a huge reach and a huge impact and one of the reasons what I decided to be a filmmaker from having been an anthropologist was that you know as an anthropologist an archaeologist uh, student in Colombia I got to to learn these amazing stories from because I work in the jungles of Colombia in the Amazon in the Caribbean in the Pacific in the Andes mountains and I got to meet people from all the community, different indigenous communities, uh, the Afro-Colombian communities, uh, rural communities, city communities. And then I realized all these amazing stories, if I stay in, in academia, just as an anthropologist or an archaeologist, these stories, only two or three people will read it. And then I thought, oh, you know, but how can I reach the, the biggest the largest amount of people with, to tell these stories that are so important. And these are stories that are not being told, that no one knows. Uh, and I thought film and television, and that's how I got interested in film and television. And here I am, you know, and it's like, you know, there's gonna be like when, you know, Shelter releases in a month, when it's gonna have the premiere, it's gonna premiere in 213 countries with millions and millions of viewers. So how amazing is that? You know? In episodic, and uh, you know, and then in movies, you know, it is is also a complete different animal. You know, just like you know, it's a more just one story that is beautiful too. And you know, I, uh, there are a lot of similarities. You know, like the the craft itself of how you work with the actors, how you work with the cinematographer, is the same. I think uh, it, when you are doing an episode you adapt more to you know the showrunner the creator of the series is the equivalent to the director in the film they are the ones that have they they know they're determining how the story is told so you're like an instrument and I, I like being an instrument i i love to adapt to the stories that, that the showrunners are telling there are so many opportunities that i've had to to direct stories i would have never directed before if it was not because i was working in television Thank you so much for that response. And now I'm going to pass it on to Madeline for her last set of questions. Thank you, Carla. Uh, hi, Patricia. Thank you again for spending your time with us today. My name is Madeline. Uh, and while I have the opportunity to work on the CNA Latine project this summer during the academic year, I'm a master's student in the Latin American Studies program at the University of New Mexico. So I have a few questions to wrap up this wonderful conversation. And I'd like to talk a bit more about the theme of representation, some of which you've already touched on with Carla and Mateo. Uh, so my first question is, being a Latina filmmaker and professor in film, 
I'm curious about how your perspective as an academic shapes the way you see and teach Latine representation in films. So how do you see uh, Latine representation in film and its evolution over time? Yes, so, you know, I teach uh, directing and filmmaking, making films. I, I do not teach uh, critical studies when you study like the representation of the Latina community, but I am very aware of that. And it, in every single class that I talk about, part of the curriculum is bringing in that awareness to all the students. You know, what is the representation? Uh, you know, is, is it reflecting the reality or not? in terms of the percentage of roles, in terms of the speaking parts, in terms of the stories that are being told, in terms of the characters that are being represented. Uh, because I think, uh, you know, most of us, many of us are not really aware because we just watch and watch and we don't realize what is the amazing power that representation has, how like we see you know, people like us and we see, oh, you know, we can be present if we see someone like us being present. You know, like, uh, you know, it was amazing for me actually to direct Gina Rodriguez in Diary of a Future President when she plays like the president of the US. It's like, you know, we we have not seen many of those uh, type of characters on a screen where, where we can be powerful and complex and is historically, you know, it has changed so much from 20 years ago when I started to now, but it's still there is a lot of things that has to be changed. And, and to me, it's very important to teach the students. It's like the the also what the power and responsibility that they have as media makers, because it's uh, it's a lot of power. You know what the way you cast a project, the story that you tell, you know, it's going to be seen by millions of people. You know, sometimes by three people, but you know, eventually it can it has a huge impact. You know, if you get to work. In, you know, in television, it has a huge impact. And, you know, and you are responsible for uh, for what you put there. And I, I think this is very empowering for the students to realize that they have that power and they just need to use it. And I'm not gonna censor or tell anyone what to do. You know, you can tell any story you want, but I just want you to choose with awareness and not by default. You know, for example, in, in, in many of my directing classes, I ask the students to, do a presentation about their uh, their favorite filmmaker, and you know I teach at UC Riverside, which is uh, one of the most diverse universities in the US. You know, it's like number one in social mobility. The underrepresented people in other classes, amazing, amazing students in terms of talent, in terms of stories, and uh, you know most of the classes is you know it's just diverse students, and. Uh, I ask them to do this assignment, just bring a presentation, a presentation about your favorite filmmakers. And 99%, they talk about a white man director. And I am just, okay, you know? And then I have them do a second <laughs> presentation about a filmmaker that have their same gender, their same background, and to, to do a more, you know, a more intentional search. Because that's our default, you know, like most of the, of the filmmakers, they like to talk about Wes Anderson and Christopher Nolan, uh, you know, like, uh, like these directors and Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola. So I also in my classes, I have students, I have diversified the canon of films that are taught, you know, usually traditionally film is taught using movies by, you know, like the graduate, like the, the, um, no, not the graduate, Francis were called up the, the godfather. <laughs> you know, traditionally uh, in academia, filmmaking is taught using movies directed by white men, like, you know, Francis Ford Coppola or Martin Scorsese or Hitchcock. And I always, you know, I make a very intentional choice of also trying movies directed by women, by international directors, by people with, with uh, people of color, you know, because it, it, it is unconsciously, you know, it makes it, you know, it makes us feel the stories. Oh, you know, if they, you know, another woman of my same ethnicity direct this movie, I can do it. And, you know, it's, it's a very subconscious uh, perception. So I, you know, I like the students to, to develop that awareness and they can make whatever choice there are. But I always see that in the long run, they always come out of my classes with, uh, with a lot of more awareness that they had before. And I'm, I'm also more empowered. You know, I, I used to say that I wanted to empower my students. I was the 
it was most important to me. But now I realize it's not to empower them because they already have the power, but to make them aware that they have that power and how they can use it. Uh, because I'm not giving them any power, they have it. You know, it's, it's like, how do you use it? And how you make those choices? Thank you. And thank you for, for doing that work. Um, it's definitely not easy, but I think it's a lot of what you said is clear that you don't have to be teaching about representation to include it in, in whatever you're doing. Uh, so thank you. And for my second question, um, slightly related, how can representation through film, um, like what we see in all of your work, be a vehicle for a more inclusive society? Um, so what message do you want to leave younger audiences with, like in Real Women Have Curves? Uh, and what do you hope that they do with that message? Well, you know, I just, you know, I want everyone to realize that every single life, every single person is important and is valuable. And I, you know, when, you know, and I, you know, like even last quarter, I had a student, this incredibly uh, Latin man, so tall, so handsome, so smart, so talented. And he, because I talk so much about representation, he said, it's true. You know, I feel that I'm worth less than a white male person and 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 you know and it was amazing very brave for him to admit it because a lot of us feel like that so so I guess everyone to realize that we have those you know those uh, uh, subconscious ideas about ourselves that we are less of that we're less capable so I think everyone I want everyone to 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 really feel that their life their story is is as important as any other story and deserves to be told. And also to, you know, I, I like the world to look like the world that I, when I walk outside my house, it is, you know, to, you know, and, and this is also, it's not only uh, the way you cast the story, it's like how you direct those actors, how comple complex you make those characters, because we're not just like bad or, or good, you know, we are so complex as human beings. And I love that work with the actors creating characters that are very real, re very real and very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I think I can certainly speak for all of us uh, when we are sincerely, when I say that we're sincerely looking forward to your future work. Um, and all of the other stories that you have left to tell. Um, and our last question for today, um, given your, your history in the industry, what tips would you give aspiring Latina filmmakers who may be interested in sharing similar cultural stories and histories? Yeah, I think, you know, I always, you know, I'm hoping that I give my students confidence and that, that I, you know, but I know that's very hard to give because like I, I, I suffer of lack of confidence too, even at my point in my career, you know, just, and that's very normal. I know people super accomplished and they always like, you know, it's, it's, being confident is not easy, but I just to, I want the, the young aspiring Latin filmmakers to know that, you know, having uh, doubts and having lack of confidence is just a normal part of the process of being alive or being a human being that their stories are worth it and to just um, go out and get things made but also to be very to have that awareness um, of what that representation is what is the power that you have but also what is the film industry what are really what is really the the playground where you're going to work because it is still not a uh, a playground where there is equality you know there is still the statistics for feature film directors is like 96% uh, men 4% women so it is not you know it, it is not equal it's much better than before but it's not equal and I think it's very important to go with your eyes open and because there are ways to go around it but it is important to be able to 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 see that reality so that you can find ways to uh, to overcome those obstacles. Thank you. Thank you for elaborating on that um, and for sharing all of your experiences and, and knowledge with us today. This concludes our questions for today. So for now, I will pass it over to Mateo to wrap up our session. Thank you. Hello, Patricia. Uh, again, thank you so much for um, spending this time with us today. Um, thank you for joining me, Carla and Madeline to chat about your work and the impact that you're making on the industry. 
Uh, we've learned a lot, not only about your films, but we've also gained a lot of insight into your process and evolution as a creator and storyteller. Thank you so much for spending this time with us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a big honor to be part of this series.